If you haven't yet, please hit like and subscribe. You'd be surprised how much that helps. While you're at it, tell your friends, find us on Instagram and Facebook, and even back us on Patreon, where you can get early access and other goodies for just a few bucks a month. Thanks for being here today. Now let's get to work. In conversation, we talk about the nexus of all three of those things, plus a few fun excursions into other related topics. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Safest Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is the inimitable Lee Wedlake. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? Good. How are you out there? You know, we're doing pretty good, all things considered, up here in the Shire. Um, now, Mr. Wedlake, to people in the Kempo Karate community, needs absolutely no introduction. He started studying martial arts in 1967 in judo. He was a black belt by 1975, was promoted to 10th degree to some of his objections in, in 2018. He's a force of nature in the Kempo community, having written nine different books on Kempo, including the uh, Kempo Karate Compendium, as well as countless articles to various martial arts magazines, to the Mensa Bulletin and Aviation Magazines. Um, because developing his martial arts career to some of the theoretical limits isn't tired enough, he's also a rated pilot and instructor of pilots. So bringing this man who knows a lot about self-defense and keeping our family safe on the show today. So again, thank you so much for taking the time. A pleasure. And we were speaking a little bit about what we'd focus on in today's conversation and one of the first things that came up was just the phrase about focusing on women and kids in terms of self-defense instruction. And can you tell me why that, why that came up? Well, as you know, I've, I've taught self-defense for many, many years. And uh, you know, you've got predators, you've got prey. And predators like to go for the small and the weak. Now, this is not a generalization that all women or all children are small. Of course, there are smaller men, but they can be preyed on as well. But uh, women and children uh, typically have that percentage of being uh, taken advantage of in attack situations and all that. So I always thought it was important that uh, they both know something about self-defense. I mean, guys think like, yeah, I could take care of myself. But I used to do all these women's self-defense uh, classes and I had uh, one of my sister's boyfriends who said, well, what about me? I'd like to know some too. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't in a karate class. He's not a big man, but he says, I'd like to know something. I said, well, great idea. So we did some co-ed classes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think the focus is really on, on smaller people. No, that, makes, that makes really good sense. On that topic, one of the issues I've seen in the self-defense community in general is self-defense class for women, self-defense classes for teens or smaller men, taught by a six foot two, 250 pound Marine. And the, the, the context and the realities of self-defense are so much different for a large athletic male than for a woman of average woman size or a man who's somewhat smaller than, than average or a man who just doesn't have an athletic background. What are some of the best solutions that you've seen or encountered to come up with to address that, what I think is an important issue? The, uh, the point is well made. In fact, I was talking with one of my black belts yesterday about uh, uh, a friend of his brother's who's about 70 something years old and went to take it. He volunteered for one of the local police departments and that particular department would take their volunteers and have them take some self-defense training. And so the instructor takes this 70 year old guy and does a throw on him and like dislocates his shoulder. It's like, what's, you know, what was the point of that? In fact, my mm -hmm. black belt wanted to go uh, volunteer so he could get into that class. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, it's important. Um, that these sort of things are done. Uh, and, and people have said, well, you know, well, my girlfriend uh, took a self-defense class. So what you need to understand is that what is called a self-defense class is different everywhere. Mm -hmm. Your instructor may be that six foot two uh, former Marine, uh, could be a woman, could be a karateka, could be a Kung Fu stylist, jujitsu person, whatever. 
So, you know, the, the label is a little bit misleading. Um, but when I would teach something like this, I use Ed Parker's uh, master key concept because it was something that people could uh, make use of. And it's a simple concept to understand and to apply and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that that touches up against is when you're choosing to take a self-defense and martial arts class or enroll your kids in one to at the very beginning of that process, really figuring out why you're training. Is it for self-defense reasons only? Is it personal development? Is it so you look cool in the pajamas? Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we would teach in the business side. It's, there's about seven different reasons people will go and sign up for or enroll for martial arts lessons. And, uh, some of them truly do want self-defense. They were attacked or they, they were almost attacked and said, I better prepare myself. Other people do it because it's athletic. Other people want something to do. They want to meet people. They want pride of ownership. I'm taking karate. Um, so they do need to understand why they want to do this. They want to understand themselves. Can I really do it if it comes down to it? There's a decision process. It's like, you know, if you're um, going to learn these, these sort of things, and we're going to teach you how to kick somebody in the groin. Can you actually do that? Okay. And will you actually do that if it comes down to it? Um, an important factor with signing up for any kind of a course, enrolling for any kind of a course, is that uh, do a little bit of reading. And if you're looking for uh, karate classes, go down and watch the class. If they don't let you watch it, I wouldn't enroll there. And um, you need to have some sort of a rapport with the instructor. So if you get to go watch a couple of classes here and there, you can look at somebody and say, I think I like that person as an instructor. He seemed to do a pretty good job. He seemed to be competent and I'm gonna trust them to take me where I wanna go. Versus uh, you know, a lot of schools where it's like, no, we don't allow anybody watching classes. Not a good idea. Yeah, that's that was certainly the trend. I, I feel like that trend is um, kind of extincting over the last few years as more people understand that it's much better sense for a student to check out the class first and much better business and more transparent. I think it's just better, it's better technique in general to show what you have and let people judge you based on what you have. If you, don't, if you need to hide it, what is it you're not proud of? It's, uh, it's gotten a lot better. You're exactly right. It's, it's a long process. I mean, back in the 70s, we were in dungeon dojos and the windows yeah. were uh, Today, it's like a lot more kids, a lot more women taking it. Uh, it's easier to do the research. Where did you say you came from? Those people never mm -hmm. heard you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, a little bit of Google food can answer a lot of questions. Google food, yeah. I like. Yeah, and a lot, you know, <laughs> Most, most schools these days either have that deal where you get a few extra classes or a few, a few beginning classes for free if you buy the uniform, or you get the uniform for free if you buy a few classes, which gets you four or five sessions in the, in the school, so you can get a real sense of what's going on. Yeah, I think, I think that's important and, uh, because it, it makes a big difference. You know, This is going to have an impact on your life. It's going to um, affect what you do physically, it's going to affect how you think, how you relate to people and so on. It's, it's an important decision. Yeah. And it can literally save your life, whether it's actually using the combative skills when something comes down or just what it does for your longevity and general quality of life to get a good cardio workout twice, three times a week. Yes, yes. It's mentally stimulating, physically stimulating. It's so really good for all ages. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm too old to do this or I have to get in shape to go do this. It's like, you're never going to get in shape to go start. You might as well start now. Mm -hmm. I had a 68-year-old <laughs> man who was taking my Tai Chi class, saw the Kempo class and said, can I do that? And I said, there's only one way to find out, Rick. Mm -hmm. And so we got him in class and five years later, he made first degree black at the age of 73. Well, outstanding. Yeah. 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 Now that kind of brings up the next item on the list, which was one of the objections that you sometimes hear from a parent about putting their child in a martial arts class is, well, if little Johnny or little Jenny learns to kick and punch, 
they might go kick and punch on the playground. And that bumps right up against uh, bullies in school and zero tolerance policies. And I suspect you have some opinions about that. I do. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a saying like karate is good for kids. And I read uh, Dave Lowry, who was uh, I used to write a regular article for the magazine, say karate is not good for kids. It's the people that teach karate that's good for kids. Mm. So our focus when I had a, a commercial school and you know I, I oversee a lot of school commercial schools now is we need to be the role models. We need to set the guidelines and we need to make an impression on them. When I teach children's seminars, I say, you, you know, you know that you can't go out and use this on people, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, kids relating to adults are go, yeah, yeah, I know, uh, because you're the adult. And so you have to go the next step with, with further question, like, well, when do you think you could use it? And then you get the child that comes in and they've taken the karate lessons and then they come home one day and they've been punched in the nose, beaten up or what have you. And then the parent comes to you and goes, well, they were taking karate, but then they got beaten up at school. I said, do you know what the first thing was you told your child when you, you brought them home from class? Said, now you know you can't use this on people, right? <laughs> so now <laughs> you've got a six, an eight, or nine-year-old that's you know being threatened, and it's going. Um, I know I, I can do this kick and punch and all that, but I was told not to use it on anybody. So what do I do? And they get caught in a classic Hicks's mm -hmm. choice uh, sort of thing, and uh, and they get punched in the nose. So it's one of these things that the instructors need to talk about with the children and the parents. The parents need to, what are the parameters? Mm. Okay. When can you do this? We give them the options to go, look, learning karate doesn't mean you have to punch and kick people. Learning karate means learning to recognize situations that you can walk away from, run away from, look for help. Okay. Um, if somebody has got your corner, there's nothing else you can do. You can use footwork. You can use your footworks in your blocks. And then finally, if you have to, then you got to zap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kids need to know what their progressions can be. And they need to know what their parents will, will back them up. Now, when they came up with the zero tolerance policy for bullies um, back in the 90s, he said, zero tolerance. And one of my uh, parents came in and she was uh, a volunteer at this, one of the grade schools. And, and the subject came up and she's, she's from uh, Thailand. And she says, little boys fight. That's what they do. Yeah, they do. And there's a good psychological reason uh, for these sort of things and why people watch fights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they look at that and go, I don't want that to happen to me, so I better pay attention. Okay. My mother came in and said, uh, what do you think about the policy? And I looked at her and I said, what do you think I think about the policy? I'm a karate instructor. <laughs> yeah, I'm an old school guy. It's like my dad said, you know, if he punches you, you punch him back. Yeah, and that's, that's the way that it goes. And guys have got a weird, you know how this is. You know, you beat him up, he becomes your best friend. <laughs> it's a very odd yeah. reaction. But I understand. I mean, there's all these pitfalls. Like, kid gets picked on, he finally had enough, he hits him back, and that's when the teacher turns around and sees it. Mm -hmm. So the one that was defending himself is now looks like the bad guy. There's all of these things, but they need to be hashed out. And parents need to tell the child, like, you can do this, you can't do this, this is what we'll do. Some parents will say, I will back you up 100%. Others like, eh, I don't know. Family's got to make that decision, in my opinion. And uh, Rory Miller, uh, in one of his books, uh, draws a parallel between zero tolerance policies in school and teaching abstinence-only education. They're both deeply naive. <laughs> right. yeah, it's we, human nature people fight yeah yeah fight and i think i think that it's what you're saying is very important it actually prepares kids for adults and i would like to see more of this in adult self-defense classes about here are some skills that you can use to harm another human being if you have to society at large whether it's the school policies or the law 
says you're not supposed to hurt people. So you need a real strong framework, not only of how you're going to give yourself permission to protect yourself, but also how you're going to justify that use of force with the authorities around you. Again, whether that's the principal or whether that's the police and uh, later a prosecutor. You know, that's, uh, you have to have the fertile prepared mind as a friend of mine says. Mm -hmm. and you need to think about this as like, okay, I'm going to, I want to go learn these skills. Now, what am I going to do with that? Mm -hmm. And will I actually do it? And then, you know, you might tell yourself you'll actually do it, but when it actually comes down to it, <laughs> you know, what was good in theory isn't going to happen in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in enough situations in street fighting and working uh, with the police department and the security business and sometimes some pretty hairy situations to know like, okay, I have a pretty good idea how I'm going to respond to this. And I've got a pretty good grounding on uh, force progressions. And so uh, most people don't. Um, and the laws are different everywhere. I was talking with a woman, I taught a self-defense class in California and, and she came up afterwards, she says, you know, this is all great stuff, but I don't know if I could actually do it because I was told I can go to jail if I do, if I hurt the, the assailant. I think that's a reality. But you have to make the decision. Are you going to do this to protect yourself or not? Mm -hmm. And one of the funny things about Kempo Karate, which is Mr. Wedlake's art, my own home art as well, is it's structured as, a, as if this attack comes in, here is something we can do about it. And many of the techniques, there's something we can do about it. And then they're on the ground and we've broken something. And then we hit them seven or eight more times. <laughs> Which I which I I will often pause while instructing there and go, okay, now keep in mind that we are now moving from self-defense to aggravated assault. So just keep that in mind, folks. And you know, it gets a laugh, but it's it's real that there's the realities of self-defense. Again, whether it's a kid in school or an adult coming out of a bar, are something that we should talk about, think about, and teach about much more than I think we do as an industry. Um I agree with you. I spend time with my guys on uh, mm -hmm. moral, ethical, and legal aspects. Mm -hmm. I've written it in my books. I mean, you've read them and, and I'm sure you've seen those. Uh, I had one section in there written by an attorney about use of force. Um, so there's a lot to it. It really boils down to what's happening at the moment and that how well are you trained in knowing, like Ed Parker's thought when he taught us, he said, I want you to do multiple movements and take them all the way down to the ground and beyond. But you, I want you to be over skilled. It's not overkill, mm. it's over skilled. Mm. But that has to be coupled with knowing when to stop. And just because you know how to do something doesn't mean that you should do something. So if you're going to do all 16 moves of dance of death on somebody because they grab your lapel, well, you better be ready to spend some uh, time at the men's, uh, men's club up there at the federal pen. <laughs> Truth. Now that brings up this important thing about under thinking about ahead of time, what you're going to do, how you're going to respond, what permissions you have for yourself about if somebody, if I see this level of threat or this level of danger to myself, how, how can I ethically, morally, and just realistically respond versus this level of threat to myself or this small level of threat to my child? And I think that's especially difficult for a lot of the parents who watch my show because there's people who are martial arts nerds and there's people with military and police backgrounds. And then there's people who are normal, which I'll be the first to admit that we're not normal. Uh, right. <laughs> and so, so for those folks who aren't, necessarily you know interested enough in martial arts and self-defense to go spend two or three hours every week in class and practicing outside what are some of the things that they can do some thought processes or thought exercises or just questions to ask themselves that can help prepare them for this kind of situation well you and i both know there's a phrase uh, knowledge is power which is why you're doing this, this sort of show. And uh, so somebody has said, 
I think I need to do some self-defense. Why? What is it that leads you to this? Okay, you know, like my wife in particular is like, uh, she lives in a world of puppy dogs and butterflies and doesn't think anything's ever going to happen. And there are lots and lots of people out there and you got people like me that look and we've seen all this horrible stuff out there and go, it's very, very possible. And I would like you to be prepared for it, but they have to make the decision. Somebody said, it's a logic tree. They said, uh, I think I need to do this. Why? Because I go into areas that are a little bit dicey or I've had friends that are attacked, or there was something in my life in the past, I think I need to prepare myself for this. And then run that list of um, ideas and say, can I do this? Will I do this? Um, I have children involved and you know, mothers will fight to the death for their kids. The ones that don't are called sociopaths. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, but, I need to know, it's just like, if I'm gonna go cook dinner, I need a recipe. If I'm gonna protect myself, I need a recipe too. And which particular item do I wanna pick on this menu? Do I want it to be empty hand self-defense? Should I go buy a gun? Should I carry pepper, uh, pepper spray or mace or something like that? Should I lock myself in the house and never go out again? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you have to make these, these decisions based on that and then go get the appropriate training. Like uh, going out and buying uh, the keychain pepper spray seems like a good idea, but it's not really. Uh, for a number of reasons, you're starting to smile at, so I, I know <laughs> <laughs> you're on the same page. Um, mm -hmm. You got kids, maybe carrying a gun's not such a good idea. Okay. Uh, keeping one in the house, at least in most states, you have to have them locked away. Trigger locks and all that, well, that kind of negates the self-defense uh, application of, of the weapon, unless you've got um, the coded boxes and, and all that good stuff that goes along with it. So um, I think that for most people, you know, particularly about moms with kids, it's really getting educated on avoidance. Mm. And... Um, environmental awareness. It's one of the things that I see frequently is parents putting children in a car seats and you're so wrapped up with trying to figure out how all those buckles go together that you're not watching what's going on around you. And the bad guys know that. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, you see somebody who's pretty tuned in and mom's in there and she's working on a child and then she'll look around over her shoulder, get back to work and she'll look around over her shoulder. She's paying attention. Those are the sorts of things that can go a long way. And those women's magazines print that stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Those uh, self-defense tips for women, that's great stuff. Um, so I would advise like, that's one of the things you do. And of course, a lot of these things apply to men too. And I would make a, uh, a comment during women's class that they like, you got that urge for cookies at two o'clock in the morning, don't go down to the 7-Eleven and park on the dark end of the parking lot where those guys are. That applies for anybody. Yeah. And, no. Yeah, that, that avoidance and awareness is, for some of the reasons we've talked about, and of course we're not making sweeping generalizations, there's the Olympics are going on as we record this, and there's a lot of women at those events who can kick my butt six ways from Sunday. But in general, women need to use that awareness and avoidance a little more, but men should want to. I mean, it doesn't matter. You. You're a stone badass, but there is a non-zero percent chance that you would die getting into a tussle with a 17-year-old punk. And there's a zero percent chance that you would die if you avoided the fight completely. And that's true of everybody. Um, you know, I noticed that on your shelf there, you've got The mm -hmm. Gift of Fear by Gavin mm -hmm. Becker. Everybody should read that. I don't care who you are. You should read that book, uh, read Protecting the mm -hmm. Gift. Mm -hmm. For that. And one of the things that Becker states over and over in that book is trust your gut feelings. And my experience with talking to women that have uh, told me things that have happened just backs up what he said. So I recommend that book highly because uh, he addresses that the sociological aspect, which is like 
women are supposed to be nice. And when a man says, you know, can I help you with that? You're supposed to let him do that when actually he's a bad guy and he's setting you up. If you got a bad feeling about it, go with that feeling. You may feel a little bit embarrassed because you ask, ask somebody for an escort out to your car, but that's better than being attacked. Yeah. So that's a question that's uh, kind of plagued me lately about how we are born trusting our guts. And we spend our infancy and our toddler years and our cruiser years just trusting our guts and going with that gut feeling all the time. And it seems like about from the time we start school until we get to our mid-20s, society just beats the hell out of trusting our gut and tells us not to trust our gut, tells us to second guess our, our instincts for social reasons, to get along in class, et cetera, et cetera. And I would love to change that, but I don't think we're going to change that anytime soon. So in some ways, I think a lot of us as adults are in recovery for that. And what are there some things that you've seen that are good ways to re, I guess, renew our acquaintance and friendship with our gut? That's a really good question. And I think that, uh, you know, just looking back at the years that I've been teaching, you know, there's that huge cultural impact on that. And um, people would like to say, well, let's just stop fighting. <laughs> and you have to. I mean, mm -hmm. you fight. You fight for oxygen. You fight for food. You fight for water in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you, you just have to do this. And we've been on this planet for, I don't know, how many million years? Thousands and thousands of years. And you got here. We got here because people trusted their gut. Mm -hmm. and we can't let that go so I think that um, that's the place of people like us that are martial arts instructors is you know we're in that class with uh, bodyguards and military and police officers you know and so on it's like we are we're the people that preserve that and pass that on Standing. now there was one other note on the you know, kind of on the, the notes we took about what we wanted to talk about today. And that was using the mommy voice, which is another good alternative to put in hands on. And even though you don't necessarily know the, the mugger's first, middle and last name, you can still get the tone right, I suspect. Yes. Um, I picked up that term. Uh, it's, a, it's a great term from a, uh, a couple. And uh, they were both Secret Service agents. Uh, you may have heard that story when I, I taught the seminar in California. But um, the two of them saw a man that was being assaulted on the street, and they went running on down there to uh, do what they needed to do to stop it. And the man, the husband, was, was ahead of his wife. But before he got there, this uh, man who was being assaulted was about to get his head kicked in. They'd taken him down, and a guy was going to stomp him. So the female uh, said, I used my mommy voice and she yelled, stop. And uh, the guy actually stopped in mid kick and looked at her and, and desisted. And they were actually able to arrest these. Uh, there were actually a couple of them. They arrested these people. And that's not a unique story. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking with authority, there's an acronym that uh, I learned many years ago, it's CLAP. It's like, it should be clear, loud, as an order, with pauses. So like in the security business, I would say, stop what you're doing. Put your hands where I can see them. Yeah, and, and so on. Not, stop what you're doing, put your hands where you can do. What? So you can use these sort of things. And, you know, mothers do this with kids all the time. You know that you're always, you're in trouble if they use your middle name. <laughs> it's clear, it's loud, and it's as an order. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so techniques yeah. like that are very handy and it mm -hmm. aids in presence. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've, I know women, uh, there's a lady named Dee Swan, she's a, 
sixth or a seventh degree black belt in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, she is, she's scary. But she was approaching the parking lot and she just looked at this guy and said, just back off. And he's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's an important tool to have in the toolbox. And of course, she's got the physical weapons to back it up with as well. And she's a handgun instructor. <laughs> and she had that confidence to back it up. And that's cool. uh and that that goes to one of the most important things about self-defense from crime, which is that the bad guys are generally speaking cowards. They want the easy mark. Like you said at the beginning, predators don't go find the biggest, toughest moose in the in the herd. Right. And so that speaking with that kind of authority, that mommy voice, most bad guys will just go somewhere else and find easier, an easier target. I agree. Yeah, yeah. The the most recent time, the last time I was came any, even anywhere near going hands on, which is the first time I'd even had an opportunity in probably fifteen years. I ended it by saying, "Think carefully." Yeah, and that was all that guy needed to do to go back inside the bar and have his fun somewhere else. And it's that that use of the mommy voice. I had a phrase that I used mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. at work, which was. Is this really how you want to take this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see most of them think about it. Go, okay, I think I, I better stop doing what I'm doing. Yeah. In one of Rory Miller's books, he talks about how one of his lines was, hey, I'm trying to help you out here. Are you trying to make this personal and hurt my feelings? Yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, that was in a, you know, correction setting, which is a little different, but. The, yeah, that yeah. use of our voice as a self-defense tool, I think, is undersold. Yeah, it's uh, it's your primary weapon. I mean, your brain is your most important weapon, but you need to uh, voice these things and your presence, your voice and all that. Then you go to what's called soft hands. And this is for uh, like what we do in the security business. Soft hands is like you put your hands and say, okay, we're going to walk out of here. Hard hands is... Then you go to non-lethal batons, tasers, gas, and that sort of thing, and then lethal force, which is using a firearm. But uh, number one on that is that presence and use of the voice. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before I forget to mention it, I'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about your uh, your Kempo TV ah. um, channel on Vimeo for people who like what they're hearing and would like some instructions instruction from someone who knows knows what's going on. Well, yes, I appreciate that. I uh, uploaded about 1,500 videos onto Vimeo. And they're, it's broken into two, two, two tiers. One is for beginners. It's called Kempo 101. And the other one is for uh, advanced students and instructors. It's called Kempo 401. And they're by a subscription basis. But um, somebody who what needs a reminder. It's like I went to class, I learned how to do this stance and this block and all that. You can go on there and watch these uh, short videos on how you do an inward block or, or what have you. And there's um, breaks down to self-defense techniques and then there's the terminology and a lot of the strategy is in there as well. So uh, it's, if you want to go there, you go to Vimeo, Lee Wedlake, uh, Kempo Karate 101 and you can kind of cruise through that. It's uh, by subscription, and uh, there's also about 50 free bonus videos that you can watch, which should be accessible to anyone, and those include uh, my own videos, samples, uh, demos, Ed Parker, um, Brent Trejo, a lot of the, the Kempo greats, um, and there's 50 more uh, free ones up on the 401, along with another eight or 900 videos there. And again, that's the opportunity to check it out and see if it's the right fit before anybody, before you commit to the classes and the instructor. But it's definitely worth a, worth checking out for anybody who's interested in self-defense. Sure. Yeah, it's a big help. I, I did it because um, I wrote the books. I wrote a lot of books on Kempo, and it's really hard to write about moving. Yeah. And so you can put so many pictures in there, but a lot of karate books are just picture books. So I, I want to put more brain content into them. And I use the video site to say, you know, this is what I'm talking about. This is so you can see how it's done. 
really hard to get a sense of timing out of what you're reading in a book. It's true. Books and are folks, handy. I'll put yeah, they are. But folks, I'll put the I'll put the links in the show notes as well, so you can check it out easily. That'd be great. Now, when uh, you were presenting in California last spring, you mentioned something that just really caught my interest, which was some forms of uh, self-defense training that were specifically designed for a couple moving together who got yeah. in a situation. I'd love, to, I'd love to talk a little more about that. That's fascinating. I think also directly relevant to the needs of a lot of parents. It is. Uh, you were in that seminar and I did it called uh, Defending the Third Person. Mm -hmm. And that has turned out to be a rather unique presentation. I haven't seen anybody else in the Parker system do that. Um, and I got that because I was thinking about something I had seen some Russian martial artists do and said, hey, uh, that applies right over here. So Ed Parker taught us, he said, for every move, concept, principle, and definition, there's an opposite and a reverse. And uh, so typically in our standard ideal phase techniques is like we have one person defending against two attackers. Well, if you take an opposite and reverse, you'd have to say, well, what happens if you had one attacker and two defenders? And that had been touched on um, by an instructor who said, well, you know, there's an Indonesian or a Malaysian system that's called a husband and wife system. And it is, uh, techniques that are used by two trained martial artists against that third person, that attacker. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, when I did the defending the third person seminar that you were in, it was like, I know karate, my friend doesn't, and there's an opponent over here that's going to hit him, so I need to step in. I've, made, I've gone through the decision tree and said, I have to do this. There are times you say, I, I don't want to do that, or I can't do that, or shouldn't do that. There's time to say, good luck, buddy. You're the one who picked the fight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But they may not have picked the fight, you know? Yeah. They, yeah. Place, um, but it's all these considerations that we talked about. Exactly. Seminar. So this concept of having what they call a husband and wife system or whatever you want to label it, it's a flip-flop, like two trained defenders and then an attacker versus one defender and two, two attackers. And if you're a parent, and you don't even have to be a parent, you say, but parents, you got a house, you got a family, you go, kids, we got to have a fire drill. We got a problem, this is what we do. So you have a sequence of events and technique. You go out this window, you go out this back door, you meet over here at the mailbox or what have you. Make sure you, if you remember to bring your phone, you're going to be afraid, it's going to be dark, it's going to be about Smoke alarm is going to be going off, and disorienting, blah, blah, blah. So you get familiar with the whole thing, but there's technique to this. The procedure is to get out of the burning home. The technique is how you do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, out the window, out the door, front door, back door, what have you. Okay, and you practice these things. You know, you go to school or sometimes at work, and you say, you've got a fire alarm, a fire drill. Okay, you have active shooter drills. You have these sort of things. So now what you've got is a pair of people that know how to do self-defense to some degree. And they decide that if something happens, these are the things that they can do. And I had touched on some of them uh, in the seminar, but it would be a matter of knowing like if it's a male, female couple, for example, it's like, maybe she's the black belt and he's not. What can he do? Okay, he can push, he can shove, he can grab. She can punch and kick. Important thing being like, don't get in my way <laughs> when I'm punching and kicking. Um, but you have a plan. You have some sort of a plan. And we decide what leads up to executing that plan. So we don't have the opportunity to leave the area. We don't have the opportunity to back away. And now we have to go into this maybe offensive uh, sort of sequencing. What if it's two martial artists, both female, both male, both equally skilled, and they've got to take out this attacker? Is the guy armed? Okay, maybe it's not a man, maybe it's a woman. 
And then you've got this progression of what types of people you can encounter on the street. Are they healthy? Are they sane? Have they, are they not clouded by drugs and alcohol? What happens if you get the person who is healthy, but they're mentally ill and they've been drinking? And, or it's doing certain types of drugs that will inhibit the uh, uh, pain receptors. So, you know, there's <laughs> all of this stuff that, that comes into play. But uh, that husband wife system or idea is um, to take that. It's like if you and I are walking down the street and I said, uh, okay, Jason, uh, this guy's looking kind of dicey and it looks like he's got a knife in his hand. What are we going to do? And it, it boils down to, you hold them, I'll hit them. Mm -hmm. That idea sort of things yeah. like, um, and we've got an, an interesting code. So I could circle destruction in B2A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, and, that would so, be since, yeah. so it's creating a, creating a plan ahead of time. Yes. And whether that's, you know, two advanced black belts who happen to be married or happen to travel together a lot, having a very detailed technical conversation or just parents with their school-aged kids, none of whom train, having a simple code word that means if mom or dad says this, everybody else runs in on, runs as fast as you can that way and your parents will be right behind you. Yeah. It's all the same concept. You know, when, yeah. I, when I ranked up for a sixth, and, and I think you're absolutely right when you mentioned that the Kempo community doesn't address this very much at all, um, when I ranked up for sixth degree, we were to, this was with Tom Callis's organization. Mm. And we were to, you know, do a presentation, you know, 20 minute presentation of whatever you wanted, but you weren't allowed to explain it. You just had to go do it. And mm. the board, the board that came represented about between them 500 years of martial arts experience. Mm. And my presentation was because I'd been obsessing about my protecting my kids, applying some uh, squad tactics I learned from some bodyguards I worked with to family self-defense situations and this board none of them had ever seen some seen somebody involve their family in their martial arts training before and this was again 500 years of martial arts experience i think it's it's profoundly underserved oh absolutely uh i'm i'm in the process of developing a couple of scenario techniques kind of like what i did at uh, wonder valley say, okay, now here are some examples of what you might do. Mm -hmm. And there are certain simple things that you can teach uh, people. One of the important things, as I mentioned back there, was that um, mm -hmm. you need to get on the same page. You know, when I, I ask my wife to do something, and most of the time it's why. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are certain scenarios, like if I say mm -hmm. this, there's no room for why. Yeah, we need to do what I'm telling you right now. Yeah, and I think, uh, and this is certainly not unique to me. I think that people have heard this before, but it's it bears repeating that just a simple set of code words helps a lot with that. Oh yeah, yeah. And in our family, for the very longest time, it was, hey, is that Aunt Lorna? Because at the time, Lorna lived in Japan. She'd been there for twelve years. It wasn't gonna be Lorna. Yeah, and then it also by by pointing we indicated where there might be trouble, and that was just the hey everybody pay a little more attention. Uh, since then, Lorna's moved into not only into town but into our house, so that one doesn't work anymore, which is why I'm comfortable <laughs> <laughs> saying it publicly. We got a different one now, but those are very simple things that we can do, whether we're a you know passionate martial artist who's made it part of their lives, or whether we're a parent who hasn't got a lot of interest in the physical self-defense genre, right? those little things can keep our families very safe or safer yeah. anyway. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just, yeah. uh, that means get in the car, mm -hmm. <laughs> put a shell around you. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. awesome. Oh, that reminds me. Um, when we were talking about that situation where you're, you got your butt out in, in the parking lot and you're fiddling with the seat, with the safety seat, and you're exposed and um, you're exposed. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, putting the, safe, the child seat in the center of the back seat. And then when it's time to get in, you get in the car, close the door, lock it, and then strap in your kid. It's, it gives you that shell. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's always an option. 
And that really depends on mm. if you've got more than one child in a car seat mm -hmm. back or not. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, there's all those sort of things that you need to look at and just, uh, mm. you, know, you think them out and mm. uh, think ahead and be prepared. Mm. Well, Mr. Wedlake, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. But before we go, uh, you know, you've been around a lot. You've taught from Europe to Australia, uh, pretty much everywhere but Antarctica. Although I, I imagine you'd accept that invitation if you got it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've had a lot of chances to speak and to teach. Is there a topic that you don't get enough opportunity to speak about? And if so, go ahead and tell us a bit. I think that um, one of the things that doesn't get touched on very often, and I've mentioned this, is that um, I, I created a four a matrix, a four corner matrix, mm -hmm. and uh, people, at least in our kind of karate in the Kempo, will look at things and they go, well, they're taught to look for opposite and reverse of movement, but there's an opposite reverse for concept, principle, and definition as well. 75% mm -hmm. more that needs to be thought about, okay? And within those, you know, you've got concept and principle and so on, but there are certain things that the body and the mind go through under stress situations. And if you've been reading, which you obviously have when you mentioned Rory Miller and Gavin DeBecker and all that, you know about the neurochemical uh, effects and there's uh, of, uh, of stress and what kind of hormones are being dumped into your system and painkillers and uh, the effect of tachycycia and so on. All of this stuff happens and that I think doesn't get talked about enough either. Um, the neurobiological responses to stress and how it affects memory and all this is, is going to be important because later on it's like okay so what happens if um, you did get into it and you lost the fight mm -hmm. and you need to talk with the police. It's like, you've got to expect that you're going to, uh, you got your butt kicked. You ain't going to like it. It's going to affect you psychologically. Your memory is going to be screwed up and uh, you may be injured to a degree, uh, possibly severely. And all that, uh, all that needs to be talked about because everybody likes successful outcomes. And that's what we do with our self-defense he throws a punch, ah, okay, yay, I'm done. Uh, but it doesn't always work like that. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be taken in, into account as well. Yeah. One, of the, one of the best expressions of that I encountered, this is early on, this is in the late 90s when this happened to me, but our, our instructor, this was with Kempo, which has a lot of very technical, very, um, very uh, front brain consideration in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, he had us go to the, to the, track across the street from the school and sprint until it was you know legs shaking almost puking hand shaking and then had to had us try to perform the techniques and that's a fraction of what your body's going to feel like under a real attack most of the time and it was just very eye-opening about exactly what you're talking about how much that can impact our our outcomes yeah it's it's important i think that's important you know, I've met, run into a lot of instructors. I've, I've sat in and watched a lot of classes and every once in a while, you'll hear that. Well, on the street, fill in the phone. I walk and say, you ever been in a street fight? No, well then how do you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, in the self-defense, in the self-defense industry, our definition of expert is kind of soft as compared to how many times does a cook have to fry an egg before we call him an expert in frying an egg yeah. right and how many times do you want your surgeon to have done surgery before they do something with your spleen um that's what a hundred times a thousand times more often than probably some of the, the best uh experts on self-defense have been in a fight uh yeah that could be you know you know who rich hale is right yeah yeah, Rich and I have been friends for a long time, but he <laughs> liked to say that the expert is the guy that's in from out of town. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's depressingly true. Well, <laughs> sir, thank you again for coming in and taking the time out of your day to talk to our viewers. Thank you, everybody, for watching.
Uh, like I said, we'll put there'll be some stuff in the show notes so you can find Mr. Wedlake's stuff and interact with it more. So thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Mr. Wedlake. I appreciate it. All right, everybody, stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Today's episode was brought to you by our heroes over at Patreon. Todd Elner, Beth Edwards, Douglas Sedevy, Hugh O'Donnell, Art Brick, American Institutes of Kempo, Beth Pratt, Richard Hubbard, Wayfinder Advantage, Kit Bradley, Lee Douglas, Amy Rivers, Neil Festine, Kate Carlson, Rom Payton, Jenny Coakley, and Chris Jordan. Join the illustrious heroes by backing us at patreon.com slash safestfamily. If you can't, that's okay, but do consider liking us and subscribing here on YouTube or sharing your favorite episodes on social media. Even a little bit on your end can make a lot of difference here. Thank you for watching today. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.